this time in Jesus' name. And you who are old timers, you understand. Whenever we say retreat, we're taking some time apart. And we're withdrawing from all the events and activities of the year. And then we want to be able to have the blessings of the Lord, the touch of the Lord, at the end of the year as we come like this. And uh, you've been doing well before. I want you to even do better, even today, or in this uh, retreat, that we don't have people going out and then coming back. Uh, because over here, you know that the roads are quite busy. And therefore, you want to stay. And be able to have the pouring of the blessings of God upon your life. And for those who are just uh, coming for the first time, I wish I could see you one by one and have a touch in your life. But never mind, the Lord will touch you right there. For those who are coming for the first time, we believe that everything you see, everything you hear, and every prayer we pray will be a blessing to every one of you in Jesus' name. We are believing God that this time will be the time of victory for everyone. And you will not miss your part in Jesus' name. Moving on to victory through the Lord Jesus Christ and with the Lord Jesus Christ through His abundance, the abundance of grace. We are looking at the scriptures tonight as we look at the unsearchable riches of God's grace. The unsearchable riches, unlimited riches of God's grace. We look at Ephesians chapter 3. And we're looking at verse 8. Ephesians chapter 3. We're reading from verse 8. Unto me, who am less than the least of all saints, is this grace given that I should preach among the Gentiles, the unsearchable riches of Christ. Even though Paul the Apostle spent many years with the Lord, here on earth, in his personal life, in his earthly ministry, and from the time he got converted until the time he went to be with the Lord, it never stopped to surprise him. The great grace of God upon his life. He remembered his past. And he thought if anybody should have missed the touch, the love, the mercy, the grace, the blessing, the outpouring, of the goodness of the Lord. He should have been number one to miss that. But he was always giving glory to God because of the unsearchable riches of the grace of God. One, to make him a member of the body of Christ. And two, to make him a minister of the gospel. As you consider the grace of God that the Lord himself has given unto you, and that he wants to give you more of that, it will surprise you that you of all people, me, of all people, we could have these untold, unlimited, unsearchable riches of the grace of God. He says over here, he was less than the least of the saints. And yet, even though in his position, he was less than the least, and he shouldn't have had the grace of God. And yet he said, see what God has done, that he overlooked his past. And then in the present time, he showered the grace upon him. When we talk about grace, we're talking about mercy unmerited. We're talking about favor undeserved. We're talking about the goodness of God that we do not work for is priceless. You cannot pay any price for it. And yet it comes to one and all unmerited favor, undeserved blessing. 
coming to you, coming to me, coming to everyone. And it's because of that grace it does, unsearchable things, great, glorious, marvelous, immeasurable things in our lives. In Job chapter 5. Job chapter 5. Here we see the character of God, the nature of God, the power of God. Job chapter 5 verse 8. I would seek unto God, and unto God will I commit my cause, which doeth great things and unsearchable, marvelous things without number. As you prepare to receive many, many blessings from the hands of the Lord in this retreat, you want to remember that our God is so great. Our God is so mighty. Our God is so powerful. After all, He created us. And He created the whole universe. And then He redeemed us. He sent the Lord Jesus Christ so that we can have this great glorious redemption. And if you look at what He had done, and then you measure by, by that what he's able to do. Then you know, according to that verse 9, he doeth great things, unsearchable things, marvelous things without number. And I believe during this retreat, those marvelous, unsearchable, unlimited, great, Beyond description, blessings the Lord will give unto you. In Psalm 145, Psalm 145, verse 3, Great is the Lord, and greatly to be praised, and His greatness is unsearchable. You think about that. His goodness unsearchable. His grace unsearchable. His greatness unsearchable. His glory unsearchable. When you think about God, everything about God is in the infinite. So great you cannot measure. So mighty you do not know the extent of it. And because this is the God we worship, and these are the God who have come to meet over here. It should expand your expectation. Expand what you are asking from the Lord. Expand your request. Because the Lord is about to do something unsearchable in your life. His wisdom to you is unsearchable. I'm reading Romans chapter 11 verse 33. Romans chapter 11. Verse 33, all the depths of the riches both of the wisdom and the knowledge of God, how unsearchable are His judgments and His ways past finding out. Well then, if this is the God omnipotent, omniscient, and omnipresent, if this is the God, mighty, powerful, and then great as well as gracious, if this is the God, whose riches are unsearchable, and whose might is unsearchable, if this is the God who has invited us to come here, I am sure He will remove all your mountains. He will give you the victory. All round victory. All inclusive victory. You look at every area of your life. And you look at any area where you are not up to what you ought to be. And then you realize what a great, mighty, powerful God will come to here. And then he invites us and he says, He's able to do things unsearchable. 
and he will do that in your life. The unsearchable riches of God's grace, the marvelous things he wants to do, great, wonderful things that he wants to do. And as you remove every blockage, every hindrance, every barrier between you and the overflowing blessings of God during this retreat, your blessings will be innumerable. That means uncountable. That means when you're going back home, it's going to be a time of joy. The unsearchable riches of God's glory. I divide the message tonight to three parts. Number one, reckoning on God's saving grace. Reckoning on God's saving grace. The grace that saves. You reckon on that. And you have no reason not to be saved. You don't have any reason to remain in your weakness. Because there is saving grace, and you reckon on that, reckoning on God's saving grace. Number two, receiving God's strengthening grace. The grace that saves does not leave you at that point. It moves on to make you strong. Strengthening grace, supportive grace sustaining grace it supports you it sustains you it strengthens you receiving god's strengthening grace number three reigning your reign i said you will reign you will reign over every obstacle in your life you will reign over every opposition in your life. You will reign over every attack in your life. You will reign over every sickness and affliction in your life. You will reign over every defeat and failure in your life. Reigning through God's sufficient grace. Reigning in life. In every situation. In every circumstance, in every predicament, in every event of your life, to reign, to rule, reigning through God's sufficient grace. Let's come to number one. Number one is saving grace. Number two is strengthening grace. Number three, sufficient grace. Number one. Reckoning on God's saving grace. It's the grace of God that saves us. The same grace that saved Paul the Apostle. The same grace that saves you. And the same grace that's available to save everyone. In Ephesians chapter 2 reading from verse 8. And I'll back up to verse 1. Ephesians chapter 2 verse 8. For by grace are ye saved, the rich and the poor. For by grace are ye saved, the religious and the irreligious. For by grace are ye saved, the morally good and the morally corrupt. For by grace are ye saved. The people who have not gone into gross, terrible, deep sins. And the people who have committed every sin in the land. For by grace are you saved. The Lord is reminding us, nobody pays for salvation. It's all free. Gratis. Free for you. Free for me. Free for everyone. By grace. And as a reckon on that, and you understand that you can get to heaven because somebody else paid the price for your ticket. And now you don't have to pay anything. 
you come to the Lord and this grace that saved all the people that went before us, that grace is still available for you. For by grace are you saved through, through faith and that not of yourselves. It is the gift of God, not of words. Salvation is not because of the good, good things you have done. Even if you don't have any good work, any good morals to your account, you can still come and come to Jesus Christ, the Savior. Not of words, lest any man should boast. For we are his workmanship, created in Christ Jesus unto good works, which God has before ordained that we shall walk in them. Let's back up now to verse 1. And let us see the kinds of people that were saved by grace. And as you look at the portrait and the picture here, you put yourself in the picture because this is the portrait of humanity, everyone. And because you're a human being, you're part of the human race, you put yourself in the picture. And if you are as bad as this, saving grace reaches you. If you feel so low and so deep in sin, saving grace reaches you. If you feel condemned in your heart because of your past life, Saving grace reaches you. Look at the picture now at the portrait and you are seen quickened. You are seen made alive, giving you eternal life. Who were dead in trespasses and sins. That is, these people who are saved by grace, their sins were so great, they were reckoned as dead. Dead conscience. Dead spirit, dead heart, dead life is sensitive to any sin that is moral. And yet they were saved, saved by grace. Wherein in verse 2, in time past, he walked according to the course of this world, according to the prince of the power of the air. The spirit that now walketh in the children of disobedience is saying that all people have disobeyed at one time or the other. That takes sin, everybody. There's nobody that had never disobeyed the laws of God. And it says, all those who have disobeyed the laws of God, all those who have been under the control and the power, the influence of the prince of the power of the air, they were all saved by grace. That makes me to say there is hope for you. That because other people have been as bad as you are, or more terrible than you are, they were saved by grace. Remember once again, grace is a merited favor. On the search, mercy. The mercy of God and the goodness of God. And if the grace of God on the search of merit save them, you too, anyone, everyone can be saved. Among whom also we all had our conversation in times past in the lusts of our flesh. Fulfilling the desires of the flesh and of the mind. And were by nature the children of wrath, even as others. You see what it says there that these people were the children of wrath, and yet by grace are you saved. In verse 4, but God who is rich in mercy, for his great love, where we is the Lord us. Even when we were dead in sins, as quickened us together with Christ, by grace once again he has saved. And so you will see, it's repeated over and over. So you will not say, I don't have anything to pay. Maybe I cannot get saved. Salvation is for everyone. 
And then we're told in Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Romans chapter 5, reading from verse 1. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, by whom also we have access by faith into this grace. It says, Jesus is the door, and it's through him and by him. We have access, entrance, into this grace, wherein we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. It brings in the glory of God. That's actually telling us about what we're going to get at the edge. It starts with grace. And he moves on to the goodness of God. Then he moves on to godliness that grace brings to us. And then eventually from godliness to glory. The grace. Moving on to goodness. Moving on to godliness that faith and grace will bring into our lives. And then at the end of the journey, the glory of God. God, it tells us in verse 6, for when we are yet without strength, in due time, Christ died for the ungodly. This will uh, make you stop, you know, some people, they say, I, I want to do more before I can get saved. I want to become better before I can get saved. I want you, you know, do good, more good works before I can get saved. Saving grace does not need any work that you do. Giving money to the beggars and paying your dues in the church and being your best in community. There is nothing you do that will be able to purchase the grace and the favor and the salvation of the Lord. This is saving grace. And it's available for everyone. It says, when we were yet sinners, before we did any good thing, Christ died for the ungodly. In fact, it tells us in chapter 4, Romans chapter 4, it tells us the kind of people who receive the salvation of the Lord, verse 5, and to him that walketh not, as grace. To him that walketh not. You don't walk for salvation. Christ did it. All that Calvary. And it says to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly. Justifies the ungodly. Justifies the ungodly. Why you are still ungodly? That's when God justifies. That's when God saves. If you are already healed, why would you ask the doctor to heal you? It's why you are sick. You need the doctor. If you are already rich, why do you need somebody to give you a gift? It's when you are poor. You need the gift from the rich man. And it is why you are yet a sinner ungodly, not having anything to pay for that salvation. It's at that time you're ungodly, you need the justification. But to him that walketh not, but believeth on him that justifies the ungodly, his faith is counted for righteousness. Let's come back to Romans chapter 5 in verse 8. But God Commendeth his love toward us, in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. You know, some people, the way they look at religion, you will think, is when they become saints, they merit Christ dying for them. But the Bible says, while we were yet sinners, not having anything to recommend us to the glory and to the goodness of God. Why were we yet sinners? Christ died for us. And then it says in verse 9, much more than. Being now justified 
by his blood. You are not justified by your good works, justified by his blood. And the Lord sees you as if you had never sinned, after he justifies you. Your sins forgiven. Your sins forgotten. Justified. No guilt anymore. No condemnation anymore. Justified. And we're justified not by the good things we have done. Justified by His blood. We shall be saved from wrath through Him. The stain. For if when we were enemies. You see that? And Paul, Paul understood that. He was going from Jerusalem to Damascus. And on the road to Damascus, he was still an enemy of God. And it was while he was still an enemy of God that salvation came to him. It wasn't after I became a friend of God and God says, Okay, you're a good man now, I will save you. While he was still an enemy. Enemy of God, enemy of Christ, enemy of the church, enemy of righteousness. It was at that time he was still an enemy. He needed salvation. He needed reconciliation with God. Why? For if when we were enemies, we were reconciled to God by the death of his son, much more being reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Romans chapter 3, I'm reading from verse 23. Romans chapter 3, verse 23. For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God, being justified freely. If you are not saved, Whose fault will that be? Because you are justified freely. If you don't have a car, we can understand. Because the car is not free. You don't have any money to buy one. If you don't have good clothes, we understand. Because you need some money to buy those clothes. If you don't have money to buy, we understand. And if you don't have... You know, some good, good things in life. We understand because you need money to buy those things. But if you don't have the garment of salvation, we don't understand that because it's free. And if it is free, available for anyone, what excuse are you going to give for not having that garment of salvation? If you don't have the robe of righteousness, we cannot understand. Because it's free. And if it is free, none of us will have any excuse for not having that salvation, that righteousness. It says in verse 24, being justified freely by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus, whom God has set forth to be a propitiation through faith in His blood, to declare His righteousness for the removal remission of sins that are passed through the forbearance of God. You understand forbearance? When it says forbearance, it means God is so patient. He said, no matter how far you've gone in sin, I'm waiting for you, I'll just forgive you. It's a forbearing God. And because of that, He sent Jesus Christ. And now we can come to go through the Lord Jesus Christ. Ours will be that salvation in Jesus' name. Give me a good amen. And Paul the Apostle, I told you, never stops expressing his surprise for the great salvation that the Lord had given him. In 1 Timothy chapter 1, 1 Timothy chapter 1, I'm reading from verse 12. And I thank Christ Jesus our Lord. He couldn't have said that many years before that time. But now he said, I thank Christ Jesus, our Lord, who has enabled me, for that he counted me faithful, putting me into the ministry. Who was before, that is going to tell us, the reason why a 
God will deny anybody salvation, the reason why he should have been denied salvation. He's not about to tell us what he was. That if anybody could say, God could say, but anybody, you don't qualify, you don't qualify. He wants to tell us he was the most unqualified person for salvation. If we were to qualify for him, but there's no qualification, just come. Just come. That's why he's not telling us what he was. Who was before a blasphemer? And a persecutor? An injurious? But I obtained mercy. He's underlining and scoring for us again that salvation is by the mercy of God. Not by marriage. And then it says, because I did it ignorantly and unbelief. And the grace of our Lord was exceeding abundant with faith and love, which is in Christ Jesus. This is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation. What he's saying is, this is a faithful saying. And it is worthy of all people accepting this, that Christ came into the world to save sinners and he says he doesn't think you'll ever be able to measure up to the sins he committed before he came to christ that's why i said of whom i am chief i'll be each for this cause i obtained mercy that in me first jesus christ my show show forth all long suffering for a pattern to them we should hereafter believe on him to life everlasting. Well then, salvation is by grace. You can come to Christ all by grace. All your sins can be forgiven by grace. A new life can be given to you as a gift by grace. Your name can be written in the book of life in heaven all by grace. All your past deeds that are bad, that merit judgment and wrath and indignation of God, all those bad, bad deeds can be erased, taken off, not in your account anymore. All by grace, you can come in and rush in and receive all by grace. I read of a woman. She was so poor. She was owing much. And then... His pastor wanted to come and give, uh, you know, some, some things that he felt the woman needed. And it was at noon of that day. And the pastor went to her house and knocked at the door. But there was no answer. There was no response. And the pastor knocked and knocked and knocked, wanting to give this gift so that all the debts would be paid. All the needs of a marriage, because the pastor had been thinking about this poor woman in his congregation. But when there was no answer, he went back home. That evening, uh, the at church service, a woman was in the church, and then the pastor called the woman and said, "Woman, uh, I was uh, in your house today, but you were not in." Oh, and the woman said, "When did you come, pastor?" And he said, I came at noon. And the woman said, I was inside. I had the knock. I thought it was the person I owed knocking at the door, wanting to have his deal. And because I had nothing to pay, that's why I did not answer. Oh, and the pastor said, no, I'm not asking for anything. I came to give you. You know, there are some people that, like that woman. God is knocking at your door. He wants to give you salvation free. He wants to give you justification free. He wants to forgive you and cleanse you and make you so clean as if you have never done anything wrong. Free. And he's knocking at the door. Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and he opens the door, you don't pay anything, just open the door. I will come in unto him 
and then I will fellowship with him. But you know there are some people that feel, ah, they are talking about salvation. They are talking about, I'm going to pay for it. I'm going to do this. I'm going to do that. Therefore, they don't open the door. The Lord wants to give you salvation as a gift. It will be yours in Jesus' name. I come to point number two, receiving God's strengthening grace. The grace that strengthens. What a wonderful thing that the Lord saves us and then He does not leave us at that point of salvation to go on and care for ourselves. To go on and oppose or resist temptation by ourselves. To move on and overcome Satan and sin all by ourselves. No. He gives us saving grace and then to remain saved. He gives us sustaining grace. Supportive grace. Strengthening grace. The grace that strengthens us, that establishes us in that salvation. We're looking at John chapter 1. John chapter 1. And we're reading from verse 16. John chapter 1 verse 16. And of his fullness have we all received grace for grace. Grace upon grace, grace after grace, he keeps on piling it up on us. And as your days, so shall your strength be. The challenges you face, there is grace to match every challenge. The temptation that will confront you, there is grace to match every temptation. The attack, the opposition that the devil may raise, there is grace to match every opposition. And the flood and the waves that beat upon the house of your face, there is grace strong enough, great enough to match the waves and the winds and the flood. That's why it says, of his fullness, the fullness of Christ, and the fullness of grace, of his grace, of the fullness of his grace, have we all received. And grace for grace. And he gives, he gives you grace at the point of salvation. He'll give you grace when you need support, when you need strength. When you need sustenance, it gives you more grace. In Psalm 84, reading from verse 11 and verse 12, Psalm 84, I'm reading from verse 11. For the Lord God is a sun, a shield. The Lord will give grace and glory. The Lord will give grace and keep on giving grace until you come to glory. He doesn't save us and then abandon us. What would you think of a mother that gave birth to a baby and then abandoned the baby? No, that, that would not be a good mother. That would not be a mother with natural affection. But God is greater than all men and women put together. The affection of God, the wisdom of God, the love of God, the care, the kindness of God is greater than all the love and the mercy and the care and the kindness of any man and any woman. And if the women will not abandon their babies after they are born, neither will God abandon his own people after they are born again. You come to the Lord, you are born again by grace. And then he wants to give you sustaining grace. Supportive grace. Straining grace. And it says, God is a shield. And God is a sun. Or the sun shining. Shining in righteousness. And then it says, the Lord will give grace and glory. No good thing will he withhold from them that walk uprightly. He will not withdraw any good thing from you. 
grace and glory, grace and godliness, grace and goodness. He gives grace and he gives godliness to all his people. In Zechariah chapter 4, Zechariah chapter 4, I'm reading from verse 6. Zechariah chapter 4, you've been saved. You're born again by the overwhelming grace of God, overflowing grace of God, inexhaustible grace of God. Now you need to stand and stand in the Lord and stand firm. In every situation and every temptation, there is grace that helps you to stand. Zechariah chapter 4 verse 6, Then he answered and spake unto me, saying, This is the word of the Lord unto Zerubbabel. You can easily put your name there. God is no respect of persons. What he did for Zerubbabel, he will do for you. What he gave to all the people, he will give unto you. Thus says the Lord, this is the word of the Lord unto you, saying, not by might. Even when your might will fail, there is grace that will support you. And it says, not by power, even when your power will fail, there is grace that will go beyond and reach beyond your natural power to support you. But by my spirit says the Lord of hosts, who art thou, O great mountain before Zerubbabel? Thou shalt become a plain. Every mountain before you during this retreat will become a plain. Who art thou? O great mountain before a child of God, thou shalt become a plain, and it shall bring forth the headstone thereof with shouting, crying, grace, grace unto it. You see, it's all by grace for the mountains to move, for you to stand on the rock, unmovable, unshakable for you to be able to have such a strength that all the winds of temptation and all the waves of affliction beating upon you you still will stand you will not fall you will not collapse for the strength of the grace of God will keep you standing and it says, it's all by grace. It says, the headstone thereof will come forth with shoutings, crying, grace, grace unto it. Verse 8, moreover the word of the Lord came unto me, saying, The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands also shall finish it. You started building by grace. You will continue by grace. You will be strengthened by grace. And the Lord will not leave you alone until what he has started in you, until it is finished. Look at Paul the Apostle. He came to know the Lord. And what great opposition, persecution, affliction, came upon his life. But the time came when he said, Now I have finished. Finished the race. And he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. The grace of God was abundant, overflowing, super abundant and supernatural. And if the grace of God was so much that with everything he went through, he was still able to stand, you will stand. And the Lord is promising us that if the grace of God has made you to stand, 
And now you're building a spiritual house, a temple of praise unto the Lord. That your life will bring glory and honor and praise unto the Lord. What has started by grace, you will continue by grace. And then eventually you'll be able to say like Paul, you fought a good fight. You have run the race. And you have finished what the Lord gave you to do. Verse 9. The hands of Zerubbabel have laid the foundation of this house. His hands shall also finish it. And thou shalt know that the Lord of hosts has sent me unto you. You can relax now and rest. If the devil has been bringing fear in your heart, will you be able to finish the race? Thank God you'll be able to finish. In the strength of the Lord, by the power of the Lord, in the grace of God, what the good thing that has started in you, you'll be able to finish in Jesus' name. How is that? How can that be done? How is that accomplished? Just the way you got started, by grace. Let's look at Hebrews chapter 4. Hebrews chapter 4, verse, from verse 12. For the word of God is quick, sharp and powerful, and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of soul and spirit and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart. Neither is there any creature that is not manifest in his sight, but all things are naked and opened unto the eyes of him with whom we have to do. Seeing then that we have a great high priest. Seeing then we have a great high priest. You've had a great sin, there's a great high priest. You've had great weakness, there's great high priest. You've had a great stumbling block, there's a great high priest. And the high priest is greater than your problem. I said it's greater than your problem. See, then we have a great high priest that has passed into the heavens. Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast a profession. For we have not a high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted, like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come how? Boldly. Boldly. Not because you are sure of yourself, but because you are sure of Him. When you are sick, and you want to go to the doctor, and it's the doctor you are very familiar with, and you know this doctor is so caring and loving, very efficient and effective, Whatever the sickness is, you go boldly, not because you are strong. Even the weaker you are, the bolder you are, you say, just get me to such and such a place. And what a great high priest we have. What a great savior. What a great redeemer. What a great love he has. And what great grace he has. And now we can go boldly. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. That grace is here already. And the Lord will give you all the grace you need to support, sustain, and strengthen you. In Acts chapter 4, Acts of the Apostles chapter 4, reading from verse 31, and when they had prayed, the place was shaking 
where they were assembled together. If you will read from the uh, previous, uh, from the early part of the chapter, you will see that a great, formidable, almost unconquerable enemy was chewed, confronted the apostles of Christ. And these great, formidable enemies, it was like they wanted to stop them. Didn't we tell you? And didn't we warn you? And didn't we instruct you that you should not speak in this name anymore? Did it, were you not the people we commanded? And don't you know that we are the people in authority? And we have the power to destroy you. And you know Peter, Peter wasn't that strong in himself. And you know the disciples of Jesus, just a few weeks before this time, they showed how weak and unstable they were. And now, they came back to their company, to the rest of the apostles, who were waiting for them, trembling and shaking in their boots. And then they reported to them, they said, this is what they said. They were threatening the game. This is what they did. What are we going to do when we have no strength? Let's remember, the strengthening grace, sustaining grace, supporting grace. So they prayed, and you are going to pray. All the grace you need, God will give it to you. Whatever challenge is trying to threaten your Christian life, or your Christian stability, or your Christian righteousness, for the grace of God in your life, you rise up again. And so they prayed in verse 31. And when they had prayed, the place was shaking when they were assembled together. And they were all filled with the Holy Ghost. And they spake the word of God with boldness. Verse 33. And great and with great power give the apostles witness of the resurrection of the Lord Jesus and great grace was upon how many of them? All of them. Since it is free, that's why it was all on all of them. If they had to pay, then all of them will not be able to have, but it's free, you understand? Unmerited, undeserved available for everyone and therefore it says and great grace was upon them all the lord is challenging us and the lord is telling us that whatever level and whatever measure of grace we need we shall come boldly to him and he will grant us that grace james chapter 4 james chapter 4 Reading from verse 6, but he giveth more grace. Look at the challenge in your life. You need grace. That's why you came. He giveth more grace. Grace to be victorious. Grace to be triumphant. Grace to be an overcomer. Grace to be more than a conqueror. Grace to overcome temptation. Grace to go through the trials and hurt. He giveth more grace. Wherefore, he says, God resisteth the proud, but giveth grace unto the humble. Submit yourselves, therefore, to God. Resist the devil, and he will flee from you. You know, the devil is about to flee from you. With all the temptation, all the trials, all the attack, all the hot water he wants to pour upon you, all the fire he wants to make in your family, the devil is about to run. Resist the devil. How am I going to do that? By, by grace. And he will flee from you, draw near to God. And he will draw near to you, cleanse your hands, ye sinners, purify your hearts, ye double-minded. In verse 10, humble yourselves in the sight of the Lord, and He will lift you up. He will lift you up. 
Number one, we reckon on God's saving grace. Number two, we receive God's strengthening grace. Number three, we reign. Are you ready to reign? I said, are you ready to reign? So that you will not be under, you'll be over. You will not be underneath your body. You will be on top of that body. Reigning, reigning in life through God's sufficient grace. Paul the Apostle again lends us his own experience in 2 Corinthians chapter 12. 2 Corinthians chapter 12. Paul the Apostle was strong. The grace of God had made him strong. And then he had a challenge. And this challenge kind of overwhelmed him. That he thought this may soon become unbearable. He never used that word until this new challenge came upon his life. He felt this may soon become unbearable. And therefore he went to the Lord. And the Lord could have removed that thing that Paul the Apostle thought would be unbearable. But then he would not have known the strength and the height, the length and the breadth and the depth of the grace of God. Because if there is no test, if there is no problem, if there is no pressure, if there is no burden, you will not be able to test the strength of the skill that the Lord has given you. But it's when the strength is there. You'll be able to say, I didn't know the grace of God is this abundant. Maybe you question, why should God wait until Nebuchadnezzar will teach his folly seven times over? If Nebuchadnezzar did not do that, we wouldn't have known. That God can preserve those people, men of like passions like you and I, that He could preserve them all through the fire. Maybe you'll be wondering why would God allow all those presidents and princes to cast Daniel into the lion's den? If that did not happen, we would not have known the greatness of the power, the sustaining power, the strengthening power, and the protective power of the Almighty God. Maybe you are wondering in your own personal life, why should this be there? Why should this come? We wouldn't have known how great and mighty the grace of God could be in your life if God had just wiped out all your enemies, erased all the problems. But because that problem is there, now we can come to God and see how great the faith, how great the grace, how great the power, how great the might. How great the authority in the name of Jesus. This retreat, you will see that power working in your life. And you will see that grace mighty and great in your life in Jesus' name. So Paul the Apostle went to the Lord. He prayed once and then twice. And then thrice, and here is the answer that the Lord gave. In 2 Corinthians chapter 12 verse 9, And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee. There is no sun so sharp. There is no mountain so heavy. There is no river so deep. There is no fire so hot. There is no there is situation so delicate that the grace of God will not carry you through. The grace of God will carry you through. There is no challenge so high and so great 
that the grace of God will not be available. Here Paul the apostle was assured by the Lord. And he said unto me, My grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. He said, Paul, when you are weak, I'll be strong in you. My strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, would I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. That power is going to rest upon you. In 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, 1 Corinthians chapter 15, verse 10, sufficient grace. Are you thinking the burden of ministries so great and heavy? There's grace available. Are you thinking that your situation is so tense and so confused? The grace of God is available. Are you thinking that your temptation is reaching its climax? That you are thinking, hmm, am I going to be able to succumb and to, and to sustain my strength and conviction in this great a superable temptation, the grace of God is available. As your family, you have a challenge in the family that you are thinking. But this situation in the family, are we not going to collapse? The information we have, the situation we see, the terror of the enemy, can we still stand? You are going to discover tonight, the grace of God will be sufficient for you. No matter the body, no matter the challenge, no matter the problem, no matter the heartache or headache, no matter the difficulty, and no matter the obstacle or the barrier, there is grace for you here tonight. And you will come to a new life. And a new strength for this abundant grace. First Corinthians chapter 15 verse 10. But my, by the grace of God, I am what I am. You will be what you will be. You will climb every mountain. You will cross every river. You will jump every hurdle. And you will reach the place the Lord has appointed for you in life and ministry. How? By the grace of God, you will become what you ought to be. And His grace which was bestowed upon me was not in vain. The grace of God will not be in vain in your life. But I labored more abundantly than they all, yet not I, yet not I. He said, I carried a heavy load, then I realized, not me, it's a grace. I went through flame and flood, then I realized it's not me, it's grace. I sustained a great kind of blow from the enemy, and I didn't feel it. Then I realized it's not me, it's grace. I went through the trap, and then I realized it's not me, it's grace. I preached and labored more than they all. Then I realized it's not me, it's grace. You will realize that tonight. Anything you need to do, you will do. Everywhere you need to go, you will go. Every job you need to accomplish, you will accomplish. And the glory of God that you are expecting, that glory of God will come. Not you, but by the grace of God in you. I did but my abundant clay that they all, yet not I, but the grace of God which was with me, the grace of God, which was with me. Titus chapter 2, verse 11 and verse 12. For the grace of 
God that bringeth salvation has appeared unto all, all men. Do you know it has appeared to you tonight? It's yours tonight. Teaching us that denying ungodliness and worldly lusts, we should live soberly, righteously, and godly in this present world. Then in Romans chapter 5, Romans chapter 5, verse 17. Romans chapter 5, verse 17. For if by one man's offense, death reigned by one, much more, they which receive the abundance of grace and of the gift of righteousness shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. You will reign in life through Jesus Christ. Not in your own strength. Don't ever think about how strong are you? How knowledgeable are you? How mighty and powerful are you? Don't think about that. Christ in you is a hope of glory. Because it says over here, they which receive, we don't work for it, we receive. They which receive, we don't generate it in our own strength. We don't produce it on our farm. We receive it. They which receive the abundance of grace. And they receive the gift of righteousness. We don't pay for that too. Righteousness a gift. Shall reign in life by one Jesus Christ. Therefore, as by the offense of one, of one judgment came upon all men to condemnation. Even so, by the righteousness of one the free gift, notice that, the free gift came upon all men unto justification of life. For as by one man's disobedience many were made sinners, so by the obedience of one shall many be made righteous. By the obedience of Christ, it will make you righteous. Moreover, the law entered that the offense might abound, but where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. In sin, whatever sins you have committed, the grace of God is greater. However far you have gone in transgression and evil, the grace of God is greater. You'll never be able to commit sin that so much that grace will say, okay, I cannot handle that. I cannot reach far, far as far as that. I have a fire of God. It says, where sin abounded, grace did much more abound. That as sin has reigned unto death, so even so might grace reign through righteousness unto eternal life by Jesus Christ our Lord. The Lord is saying, your own time to receive that abundance of grace, that time has now come. And as other people received and enjoyed the grace of God, you too, you'll enjoy this grace of God. Zechariah chapter 12. Zechariah chapter 12, verse 10. Zechariah 12, verse 10. And I will pour upon the house of David and upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. Here is another area. There are some people. They say, I don't know how to pray. I don't know what to say. I don't know how I'm going to pray so much to be able to have this abundant grace upon my life. I could stand up and then when I speak one or two sentences, what do I say again? I wouldn't know what to say, what to tell the Lord. Even to make supplication, even to pray, even to be able to form those words and get those words out, and make our request before the Lord. 
the Lord says there's grace even for that. Can you imagine that? It's not only grace for salvation, even grace for prayer, grace for request, and grace for supplication. He says, I will pour upon the house of David, and I will pour upon the inhabitants of Jerusalem the spirit of grace and supplication. When that happens, and then that spirit of grace is put upon you, and that spirit of supplication, coming with the spirit of grace, is put upon you, what's going to be the result? Go to verse 8. In verse 8, in that day, when that spirit of grace comes upon you, and that spirit of supplication comes upon you, in that day shall the Lord defend the inhabitants of Jerusalem. Your defense has come. And he that is feeble among them at that day shall be as David. That's the David that killed Goliath. He that is feeble shall be as David. Strong. You were feeble before. And then the grace of God flows into your life. Grace to pray. Grace to receive. Grace to have this deep conviction that then makes this supernatural power go to flinch your life. Then the weak and the feeble will be like David. And the house of David, those who are strong as David before, will be as God, as the angel of the Lord before them. As the angel of the Lord. Now you can tell. That as God wants to pour upon us His goodness, His might, and He wants to manifest His power in our lives, and then He says, everything is like ready made for you, even to pray, grace, to receive, grace, to be saved, grace, to be sustained, grace, to be strengthened, grace, to be supported, grace, and then to have sufficiency in all things, all of grace. And that grace is coming to you right now. It's just for you to stand up and receive. And say, Lord, here am I, a candidate for the grace of God, a receiver of the grace of God, a recipient of the grace of God. Why don't you stand up? And then you want to start tonight. Grace abundant. Grace overflowing. Grace supernatural, grace that saves, grace that sustains, grace that strengthens, grace that supports, grace that is all sufficient, grace that makes it to rain, to rain in life. Open your mouth and talk to the Lord. If you don't know how to pray, tell the Lord, give me the grace to pray, the grace to make my request. The grace to make supplication. I start from nothing. Give me the grace to go from nothing to everything. The grace to receive. The grace to be saved. The grace to destroy me. And the grace that is all sufficient. Give me the grace tonight. And it will give you great grace. Abundant grace. Overflowing grace, supernatural grace, superabundant grace available. Don't ever think that you have committed too many sins. Grace is available in a moment of time. It will forgive everything by grace. Unmerited, undeserved, all available for you. Saved by grace. Strengthened by grace. Sustained by grace. Sufficient by grace. You become an overcomer by grace. A conqueror by grace. All 
of grace. Don't think of how weak you are. Grace covers the weakness. Don't think of the shortcoming. Grace overcomes the shortcoming. Don't think of your past life. Grace. Grace overtakes all that you've done in the past. How about your guilt? Grace takes away the guilt. How about your condemnation? Grace takes away the condemnation. How about the judgment? Grace cancels the judgment. How about the wrath of God against all unrighteousness? The unrighteousness you have committed. Grace. 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 Grace untold, grace unlimited, grace unsearchable covers all those evil things you have done. You come with your empty cup, and the grace of God will fill that empty cup. Grace to save. Grace to forgive. Grace to cleanse. Grace to reconcile you with God. Grace to write your name in the book of life. Grace to make you know all your sins are forgiven. Now you are a child of God. Remember of the family of God, all by grace. And remember there is no marriage, remember there is no money, remember there is no qualification, remember there is nothing you do. Christ did it on the cross of Calvary. All you need to do not turn away from your sin and come and say, Lord, here am I, here am I, a candidate for the saving grace of God. Here am I, a recipient of the sustaining, supportive, strengthening grace of God. Here am I, I need your grace, all sufficient grace to give you. Nobody has to complain that you cannot get saved. You can get saved. Nobody has to wonder, would my sins be forgiven? Your sins can be forgiven. Nobody has to wonder when, how, where, right now at this time. For the grace abundance is available at this time. Grace all sufficient is available at this time. Grace to cover every evil thing you have done available at this time. This is the time, the day of His grace. The time of the all sufficient grace. Come and be saved. Come. And the strength come right there where you are. Just tell the Lord, just as I am, Lord, I come unto you. Just as I am, without one plea. You are pleading on the basis of any good work you have done. On the basis of any great thing you have done, just the way you are, grace sustaining, saving, sanctifying, grace available. Come just as you are. And come and receive Paul the blasphemer, Saul the injurious man. 
Saul the murderer, Saul the blasphemer, he received the grace that gave him assurance of salvation. And he said, I am what I am by the grace of God. You can become a child of God too tonight just by the grace of God. Accept, receive, believe what Christ has done for you on the cross of Calvary. It's yours. It's yours. And if we may go through some temptations of late, and those temptations and trials, I've been trying to attack the very foundation of your confidence and conviction in the Lord. Why don't you come for grace tonight? So that you receive grace to be steadfast and steady once again. Steadfast faith that makes you steadfast and steady so that the wind and the waves of temptation will not blow your temple of praise down. You can come. Grace available. Grace for you, for him, for her, for everyone, grace. Supplicating grace, the grace to pray for your need until the weak becomes strong and the strong becomes mighty. Irresistible. God's grace, yours for the asking. The assurance that all your sins are forgiven. The assurance that you have your name in the book of life. All of grace. All of grace. Believe and doubt not. Look to Calvary, look to Christ, and Christ, because of his shed blood, Christ, because of what he did, Christ, because of bearing all your blame and punishment and sin, Christ. In all this abundance of grace and the gift of righteousness, will give you everything you need. And then you will reign in life through that Lord Jesus Christ. You can reign. Reign over those problems, those challenges, those temptations and trials. Reign. When Christ in you, Keep some pouring out grace until it overflows. Receive, it's available for you. Receive, you can be strong in the face of every temptation and trial. Strong. And you can rule and reign in the face of every challenge because of the grace that flows into your life. It stands at the door and is knocking. And if anyone hears his voice and opens the door, 
then it will come in with enough supply of grace. Abundant supply of grace. Sufficient supply of grace. Grace for every need and grace for every challenge in your life. Receive. Receive and be victorious. Receive and become more than a conqueror. Receive and be able to stand in the face of every challenge. Receive and reign. In Jesus' name we pray. Yeah. Heavenly Father, we bless your name for the opening of this retreat. We thank you because heavens are open already. We thank you because the treasure box of God is open already. And we praise you because your hands are open wide for every one of us already in Jesus' name. I will thank you, Lord, because the treasure house of the grace of God is open, available for everyone here tonight and everywhere where we're sharing the message together in Jesus' name. Lord, we pray as many as have called upon you for sins to be forgiven, for the guilt to be taken away, for the condemnation to be cancelled, and for new life to come into them, and for saving grace to become their possession. Oh Lord, give them the assurance of giving to everyone in Jesus' name. Take the guilt away. Take the condemnation away. Take all the burden of the sin away in Jesus' name. Silence the devil that accuses them of their past lives in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray this grace will bring cleansing as well, salvation as well, righteousness as well. Oh Lord, I pray you do it in Jesus' name. And this grace will become operative in every life. But new life and new behavior, righteousness, godliness, sobriety, holiness in every life by your grace in Jesus' name. Lord, I pray the grace that saves will sustain every one of us. That the temptations we succumb to in the past, Lord, from now on, will be victorious over those temptations in Jesus' name. And whatever problem or whatever challenge anybody may be going through, speak to every heart tonight that your grace is sufficient for them. And that the devil will not overcome them. The world will not overcome them. And all the powers of the enemy will not overcome them. Let everyone here tonight find your grace sufficient in Jesus' name. And put the beauty of the glory of Christ in every heart of every life. And Lord, we pray what you have begun, you will finish in the life of everyone. None will die by the wayside. None will fade away by the wayside. What you have started, you will accomplish until the very end. The grace to sustain us. The grace to support us. And the grace to strengthen us until we reach the end of the journey. Give to everyone in Jesus' name. Lord, let your hand be upon everyone. Strong and mighty that the weakness will vanish away. And your strength will take over in every life. Thank you, Lord, because we know you have answered. 
In Jesus' name we pray.